Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about Cash for Cash. But like every other company here at Taboola, we leverage the benefits of caching in order to make our production environment and Taboola's business better. However, at some point, given our growth rate, we came to the conclusion that the current design will have to scale exponentially in order to provide the same performance as before. And that led us to come up with our own path of making things a bit more efficient by integrating MySQL's Beanlog and Kafka's abilities. How did we do it? Well, let's begin. Uh, my name is Barak, and I'm a scale engineer in Taboola for the past four years, and overall been around software since 2006. Uh, in my spare time, I like to brew my own beer and well, obviously drink it as well. Uh, so shout out to all homebrewers out there. If you don't know Taboola, we are a content discovery platform. Basically, we connect between publisher websites and advertisers who wants to promote their content in the open web. We provide a personalized experience in article pages and home pages for many of the world's leading publishers. A little bit about our scale. We recommend to about one and a half billion unique users monthly. Uh, we generate over three billion pages a day, and that gets translated to half a million HTTP requests per second. Uh, overall, um, a little bit above over 100 terabytes of data is generated daily and being processed and consumed by our backend services. So to better understand the problem that we are facing, um, our story begins with the life cycle of our recommendations. On the right side, advertisers use Backstage, which is our partner management system, to create advertising campaigns. Each campaign contains multiple items to recommend under certain conditions. These items will eventually reach the end users as recommendations alongside an article or a homepage. And all that information is written to MySQL DB in a few dozen tables. On the left side, we have our front-end recommender, which is a web service uh, that given a user's request to view a page, it will return a layout of personalized recommendations in real time. The front-end recommender reads all campaign configuration and features, and as I said, there are dozens of those from MySQL. Uh, and in order to make the best possible decision, it needs to weigh hundreds of thousands of campaigns or potentially millions of items in real time. And in the middle, closing the feedback loop, our backend processing layer creates and adjusts constant optimizations to the data in order to provide experience for the best possible experience for the end user. Zooming out, looking at the overall design, things are not that simple. In order to withstand that, say, that large amount of requests, you can see that we have seven front-end data centers spread across different regions of the world, each with hundreds of front-end recommender services. Since we recommend globally, we need our service to be as close as possible to the end user to provide a fast and reliable experience. And having uh, services that need so much information, we need to have a local copy of all the data that's written on the backend database uh, um, as a local copy on the front end data center. So we use a source replica setup where we have a single DB, our main DB in the backend, which holds terabytes of information and gets all the transactions written on it alone. Um, all the inserts, updates, and deletes. And all that gets replicated through MySQL's built-in replication to the front-end data centers as several copies in each data center. Closing the loop and feeding the backend layer with information generated in the front-end, we use Kafka uh, to bridge between the data centers, making the information accessible for all services in the backend at once. Uh, on top of that, we can see that our backend layer also creates deep learning models and deploys them in the front-end to provide better personalization. So that's pretty standard. And for many years, that design worked really well. But as Tabula grew, we noticed that the amount of resources that we need to provide um, in order to have the same performance or same user experience had to grow exponentially. <clears throat> so now that we have an overview of the world that we live in, let's begin describing the problem in a little bit more details. And in order to do so, we have to talk about the three constraints that we have to uphold in order to make our production environment successful. And the first one is a fast response time. And that's pretty straightforward, right? 
Our recommendations, as you can see, are embedded within the publisher's website. And it means that the faster that we respond, the better user experience that we generate. And also, uh, if users are waiting for Tabula's response for items to appear in the page, uh, they will likely to navigate to a different page. So responding fast actually helps lowering the bounce rates of Tabula or the publisher. The second thing to consider is that SEO rating of our partners is impacted directly by our performance. Google's recently updated their SEO guidelines indicating that poor performance will lead to a decrease in the rating. So we don't want to hurt our publishers. We will respond fast. And eventually, it's all about the money. Uh, from reasons that I've stated before and actual A-B tests that we have done uh, in the past, we noticed that a fast response actually equals an increased yield for us. So responding fast is not only we don't want to, it's, it's not because only we don't want to hurt our publishers or our partners, is that we are also making more money because of that. So how do you speed up your uh, response on a service that needs to access hundreds of thousands of lines of rows uh, in real time? And you've probably guessed it, uh, data locality. So as we saw before, all transactions are written to the main DB in the backend data center. And the first stage will be to generate several local copies in each of the, in each of the data centers uh, by connecting MySQL's replication mechanism. So we reduce the query time from uh, across regions from hundreds of milliseconds to single digit millisecond. But that's not enough. On top of that, we use Memcached as a centralized cache in each data center. Memcached is very fast, it runs in memory, and that reducing the single digit millisecond into the sub milliseconds range for a single query. However, uh, as I said before, our front-end recommender needs to weigh hundreds of thousands of campaigns in real time. So we also need to keep an in-memory cache of a working set in each of the services. Uh, there are two types of caches, a bulk cache that is used mainly for small tables, loading the entire table and refreshing it periodically in the background. And the second type is the more interesting type, um, is a by-key cache. So every information gets loaded by key, and every key is assigned with, with a certain TTL. And what usually will happen is once that TTL expires, we will go on the background, either to Memcached or the database, uh, to fetch that information again. So we reduced the query time from, um, I'd say, sub-milliseconds to nanoseconds of getting it from in-memory um, um, caches. So up until now, there's nothing new here, right? This is traditional cache layering used widely, widely in, in every company. However, caching comes with a price. And the price is data freshness. And that leads to my second constraint. So the more fresh data that we have, the higher yield that we generate. And the explanation here is, again, pretty straightforward. Uh, since our front-end recommender needs to weigh hundreds of thousands of information lines in real time, the better, uh, the faster that I close the feedback loop coming from the backend, the better decision makings I can make in real time and provide a better experience for the end user. I also need to avoid uh, serving campaigns that have depleted their budget. So if I use campaign items that no longer has a budget, I cannot bill the advertiser for it. And therefore I lost the potential yield of serving another campaign that I could have used that actually has a budget. And last but not least, real-time configurations. In an environment where with half a million uh, HTTP requests per second, closing a harmful feature in a matter of seconds and not minutes could mean a great deal. But that kind of feels like tug of war, right? So on one hand, I must respond fast. And caching is probably the only way to achieve that. But on the other hand, I must have an up-to-date information to provide the best possible experience and to actually be more profitable. And to better describe that type of war that's going on, I want to show you our buy key cache access button on a single machine. We can see that the access pattern is actually of providing over 1 million uh, cache item reads per second. And that is a very large number. So we need to access a lot of information all the time. 
Uh, looking at the update pattern, we can see that we have an, an outstanding number of 13,000 cache updates per second. And that's when we choose TTLs in the minute scale. So still a great gain, but uh, our data is up to date up to minutes and not seconds as we want it. And the cache TTLs are right in the middle of the battle, right? So at first we wanted to have fresher data. So we reduced the TTLs to the seconds range, updating the information in the background. So there will be no impact on the request thread. However, having a lot of background threads creates a lot of load on the machine. There is serialization of the fetch data that is not neglect neglectable at such scale. And most of the time, you're serializing the same information that you already have in the cache because you don't know if it changed or not. You're just going to check if that piece of information has changed. So there's also a lot of memory overhead by creating new and temporary objects. And that creates a lot of load by the GC that needs to clean those uh, objects later on. So <clears throat> if we were to reduce that TTL of seconds, uh, of minutes to the seconds range, that number of 13,000 updates will probably multiply by at least 10. And the generated load will be so significant that it will be impossible for us to support it with a reasonable amount of resources. And that leads to my third and final, con final constraint. So the lower the load that we generate in the system, the lower the cost that we have. And again, pretty straightforward. If we generate less queries, we will need less database machines and less memcached machines to actually withstand the same scale. Um, each of the front-end services if it will, uh, that, that uh, responds to requests, if it will generate less load on the same machine, it could withstand a lot more requests in parallel. There is less operation, operating uh, uh, and scaling costs because of network and licenses that you need to purchase to support that same, that larger amount of machines. So basically, if we reduce the load, we can do much more stuff with less resources. But it gets even bigger than this, because if we can free a lot more wasted CPU that goes on on updating the same information over and over again, we can direct that computations that are used for signalization for better personalization or better user experience, making Taboola's more profitable, making us generate a greater yield. So given all that, we started brainstorming on how we can achieve that. We want to have a reduced load, get the most up-to-date information while keeping a fast response time. And the surprising answer was to actually go backwards, right? So we came to the conclusion that we need to reverse the order in which new data is discovered on the critical path. Instead of pulling data from the database over and over again, we need to push the new data to the front-end services. So describing the solution is rather simple. And it has three main phases and one constraint. The first one would be understanding when the changes are happening. I want to detect the changes on MySQL tables, and I have to do it in real time. The second phase would be uh, distribute those changes across all the, the data centers and having them pushed to the services that needs to uh, um, respond to that. And the last thing would be to inject the data directly to the cache, skipping any read from any external source, making all the work in in-memory work. And the constraint that we have to withstand is that the um, overhead load that, that is generated by the new solution must be orders of magnitude lower than the load created by lowering the TTLs to a matter of seconds. Otherwise, well, this is a cool feature, but I haven't created the load um, uh, reduction that I wanted. So how do you detect changes on MySQL tables? Well, the major issue that we have with that is that we have no single point of code where all the changes go through. There are multiple services and they're written in different languages, Java, Python, Go, and so on. Um, and even if there was such a point, a lot of the changes comes in the forms of update where. So 
who's ever running that query doesn't even know which, which rows it affected. Uh, it doesn't know what the effect was. Some changes, some uh, rows were changed. Some of them already had that change. Uh, so there is no single point of place where I can say, all right, that change happened uh, on, on our code base. Um, so we thought about the beginning using triggers, uh, adding a trigger on each table that will register um, that change to a change list table, right? But oh, that would mean slowing down all the transactions that happen on the database because the database not only needs to write the changes that it does, it needs to document those changes elsewhere in a, in a different table. But we have a lot of changes. We have peaks of over 1 million transactions per minute. And slowing down these million transactions is not an option because it creates a slowdown and a ripple effect across all of our backend services. So looking back at the overall design, we noticed that we are already detecting changes and transferring them across our data centers, creating local copies. But we're not doing that per se. We're letting MySQL do that. So how does that work? Uh, it works using uh, a term called MySQL bin lock. So MySQL actually writes all the transactions that are, are happening on the source node, on the main node. Uh, to a binary log file. Um, this binary log file is actually uh, a history of all the transactions that happened. And in turn, these transactions get transmitted to the replica nodes. However, even though this is an actual file that the transactions are written to, the replica nodes uh, gets it as a stream constantly and not as a file uh, that is sent when the file is, is closed. So the nodes are actually getting the transactions in real time. Each transaction is labeled with a global transaction ID to ensure data integrity, so you know you haven't missed any of the transactions. The replica nodes, in turn, writes those transactions to its relay load and, and applies them on its own data structure. So what if we could tap to that stream of transactions? Um, if we could do that, we could actually get every change that happened, every transaction that happens on MySQL. And luckily, uh, there is a great open source library that provides exactly that, a Java client with a very simple API to connect to. I've added a link at, at the bottom of the slide, uh, so you can go ahead and see it if you want. And that's exactly what we've done there, right? We've created our own bin log service, consuming all the transactions that occurred uh, on, on our main DB, processing, in the, process them, processing them in parallel, wrapping them up, and sending them away to the front-end data centers. By tracking the global transaction ID, we can ensure that at least once delivery is happening. The bin log service also filters and routes tables to different services. So not all services needs every piece of information in real time. So I can actually divide and conquer and separate and say that this service needs this piece of information in real time, but the other service does not need it, so it doesn't need to go through all that uh, uh, process of getting that and trying to understand whether it needs it or not. I can filter it up from. Um, not every table in general uh, needs to be responded in real time. Some tables, I don't mind responding with a DTL of an hour. Um, so this is a great ability that we gain from it as well. Another great thing to notice that we have great visibility. Uh, knowing which tables and how many changes occurs them, on them uh, helps me understand whether I have missed pieces of information uh, coming from the backend to the front end. And with, with my SQL replication, I know which transactions I might have missed, but I don't know what's in those transactions. Um, so visibility is really great on that one. Um, so we know how to detect changes in my scale tables. And uh, I must say the solution is quite elegant. What about distributing uh, those changes globally? So why not use Kafka for it? We already distribute changes coming from the front end to the back end using Kafka, and that transfers a huge number of, uh, of, of uh, lines of information that goes on. Uh, so we can do the same thing and reverse the order. And just by doing that, we created a local bypass for selected tables, uh, tables for distributing their, trades, their changes using Kafka. So, Notice that this does not replace MySQL's replication, 
since there are a lot of changes and we cannot keep all the transactions ever made on Kafka. Actually, um, our, our TTL, our window that we keep on Kafka is about one day of transaction back because of the large volume of that information. So we still need MySQL's replication to create a baseline with those tables uh, through MySQL. Also, uh, the, they both exist uh, in parallel uh, because some tables I want to keep uh, on MySQL and some tables I want to go through, uh, I want them to go through the bypass. So going back to the overall design, if in the past we only had one path of information uh, that flows from the backend to the front end, well, now we have another path. Um, we have MySQL's replication, and now we have the binlog service that acts as a replica, but sends the information through Kafka. So done with the first two stages, uh, this is cool. So now I need to tie up all the knots and connect everything to the services. Um, so in order to inject data to the caches, we actually do something that is a little unorthodox. We use embedded Kafka uh, in our front-end services, um, embedded Kafka consumers. Uh, usually Kafka consumers are associated with near real-time or backend layers. Uh, but we decided to embed them within our front-end consumers, assuming that the generated load would be a lot less than the load generated by going and fetching uh, the same information that hasn't changed over and over. So when new information arrives, um, the, the front-end service actually inspects that information and understands whether it needs to push it uh, to a certain cache or not. And then if it does that, it skips completely the DB fetch. So since we're processing transactions here in parallel, uh, every row must have a timestamp indicating when it was changed to ensure data integrity. But we already had that in, in all of our major tables, so um, no major change uh, had to be done here to support that. And now comes the cool part of it. So now that you're receiving the changes directly, you can increase the cache TTL or even completely remove it, reducing the load even further and further. So just to demonstrate how easy it is to integrate it in our system, all you have to do is inherit uh, that specific interface that I've, I've shown you here, declaring which tables are interest to you and implementing um, well, that, that method of handle message and doing with it whatever, whatever you want. So awesome, we have the solution in place and I can say great success. Uh, so just a quick recap of what we've done here. Um, we've streamed information changes from MySQL using a binlog reader client. Uh, we've distributed all the changes across the pieces using Kafka. And we consumed uh, those changes in every single service uh, in our system, injecting the data directly to the cache, skipping the DB fetch, reducing the load, and increased the TTL or completely removed it. So now let's see some graphs and, and show you how cool is this thing. So, this is pretty fast, right? Um, it takes about, uh, on average, two to three seconds to any piece of information uh, that changed on the database to reach all of our services globally, right? We're talking about thousands of machines globally that needs to get that information and understand what to do with it. Now, given the fact that our best case scenario or regular caches was in the minutes range, this is a major improvement. Now notice that this measurement includes the time that it took MySQL to apply the transaction, because the begin time is the begin transaction time that we start measuring. Write it to the bin log itself. The bin log had to be read by the bin log service, that specific transaction, filter it, and send it to Kafka. Mirror those changes from the backend Kafka to the frontend Kafka that is located thousands of miles away. And the service actually needs to consume that specific message and apply the change to its cache. Um, and that happens within two to three seconds. Not bad, I would say, right? So what about the load? And to understand the load uh, reduction, uh, I need to explain uh, um, the pretty straightforward reasoning for why it happens. So, um, well, we can assume that the number of data changes um, is orders of magnitude uh, uh, smaller than the number of cache updates. As we said, if we had uh, the number of, of uh, if we had TTLs of seconds to all of our caches, uh, that number would be in the hundreds of thousands of updates per second per machine. And the number of cache updates, the, the number of data changes that we have 
is a lot smaller than that, as we saw uh, on, on our graphs of the database. Uh, so that means less serialization and less parsing of the same data, of the same value over and over again, same value that I already have in the cache. So to show you the impact, uh, I took the same graph as before, uh, as you saw for the cache updates um, for uh, the by key cache. And I've closed the cache injection features for this specific time. So as you can see during that time, because our TTLs actually reduced to uh, support the fact that um, the feature is not working, we can see roughly an increase of about 10% in the update count. Well, uh, that on its own uh, does not seem very impressive, right? 10% um, um, for such an operation is not a lot. But looking at the load graph of that specific machine, where well, you can see a tremendous impact. The load has increased by actually 30%. So looking at this graph, you can understand that this feature is a game changer for us at Tabula. Having the ability to reduce the load by this much on thousands of machines is insane. Okay, this is a game changer. And just to complete the picture with another thing to see um, of, of what's going on, um, uh, there was a short period here where we had the downtime of our bin log service. And the graph shows uh, the total uh, queries per second on our front end uh, databases. And as you can see, what happens when the bin log service is down, the amount of queries that goes on to uh, the front end uh, databases increases significantly. So we're not only saving a huge load on each of the machines um, that, that yeah, um, serves front end um, um, requests, we're actually use, uh, saving a lot of load on uh, the front end database machines. Well, that'll be all. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thank you all for joining me today. Um, feel free to contact me. I've added my contact information on the screen. And if you have any questions, i um, available here by chat or by email uh, later on. Thank you very much again.